welcome to uh, today's event, the uh, master and his emissary. Uh, my name is Patty. I'm uh, a co-host of uh, the Sanity Project with Charles Eisenstein. And Charles Eisenstein is a speaker and a philosopher. If you'd like to know more about him, you can uh, either click on the information link before uh, below this video, or you can Google his name, Charles Eisenstein. And uh, today, Charles Eisenstein is our hosting speaker, and he's going to have a very uh, enriched conversation with one of uh, uh, author, philosopher, uh, and a uh, master of his own work, which I deeply admire. Uh, he's the author of the book called The Master and his emissary. I mean, this is the book that I read. And he also recently published um, a two volume uh, book um, and, um, that we will uh, mention toward the end. Uh, so today's theme is going to, we're gonna extract from uh, his first book. Um, and so what, uh, so my one minute reflection on this amazing book is that uh, my background, I'm a yogi and I study, uh, I'm gonna use uh, Bhagavad Gita as an example. Uh, Bhagavad Gita is essentially a conversation of a student and a master. And the student uh, represent the left brain, according to uh, corresponding to this book, uh, The Master and His Emissary, uh, that is uh, describing his despair in moving forward in life, fulfilling his duty. And then the conversation happens in a battlefield where the master guide the students how to move forward. Um, and so as I was uh, reading, um, Dr. Ian's book, I thought, wow, anything that a human live in a way that is fulfilling to their own purpose and destiny to a master level, you cannot avoid touching divinity, God. So the word God, like, emerge from my experience reading this book. So right now, I want to invite you to give Dr. Ian and Charles hands, welcoming them. I'm going to put them <laughs> on screen now. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, yeah, here we have Dr. Ian McGilchrist. And I, he, you know, his, his work has been popping into my field um, well, for decades, actually, but but uh, especially now, as some of the topics I've turned to so closely um, parallel a lot of his work, um, including an essay I just published last night uh, about artificial intelligence and its limitations. Um, and we'll probably get into that, but first, I just want to start off uh, by naming the the um, uh, the theme of. The, uh, that embeds this conversation, which is sanity. Uh, so, so Ian, you know, we a lot of people have a sense that society, uh, that the world has gone crazy, that that there's a, a derangement. Um, yeah. And I, in in the course, I, I have been looking at that from different angles. Uh, one of which is the uh, insanity of mob violence, of uh, mm. I. I draw on the work of Rene Girard a lot, uh, sacrificial violence, the dynamics of in-group and out-group, uh, ostracism, um, dehumanization, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Second piece mm -hmm. that I bring in um, is, is the uh, immersion in uh, a realm of, of abstractions, a digital realm that makes us mm -hmm. less present mm -hmm. and that can take on its own logic and get people lost mm. in, in stories and maps. Um, and I guess a related thing uh, is the insanity that comes from the cutoff from uh, relationships and their replacement mm. by uh, technology and market mediated pseudo relationships that, that mm. don't anchor us in being. So um, that's kind of the, the basis and 
of all of those, it'd be interesting to see how those interweave in your mind. Um, but it's the second, mm. I think, that is probably the most like obviously relevant to the work that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the with the left brain, and so for those of you who are not familiar, um, you know, Ian McGilchrist is is the one who really put um, a more sophisticated understanding of the left brain, right brain. Um, Mm. differentiation in, in not just like the right brain does this and the left brain does that, but the way that they do things. So anyway, Ian, I, mm. I'll just turn it over to you um, if you have any comment on what is the nature of the insanity that we sense in the world today? Well, in your introduction, those three things that you pointed to were very important. If I can remember them, I'd like to come back to them. Mm. But uh, the, the, the book that I published um, at the end of 2021, uh, this rather large, I'm afraid, book uh, in two volumes called The Matter With Things is subtitled, Our Brains Are Delusions and the Unmaking of the World, because I believe we are entailed in unmaking the world in, in a very important and catastrophic way. And, and that this is partly to do with the fact that we're frankly deluded. Why? I believe that what I've described in the master and his emissary is a rise in a certain kind of abstract thinking, which privileges the map over the territory, the theory over experience, over um, a period of a few hundred years in the West recently. And I, I suggest that in the past, there were a couple of civilizations those are the Greeks and the Romans that started with a wonderful balance between what the right and left hemisphere can offer, but inexorably moved more and more towards this left hemisphere vision. What is that vision? It's one, if I can put it this way, in which, well, maybe I ought to say just a little about why there are two hemispheres. This is a very interesting question to me. It's what started me off. Why the hell is this organ that has these interconnections and its power consists in the number of interconnections it can make? Why is it whoppingly divided down the middle? Why is it asymmetrical? You know, excuse me, if you want to expand, you can do it symmetrically. And why is the band of fibers, this very smallish, in relation to the size of the brain, band of fibers that connects the two hemispheres, largely involved in inhibition? It suggested to me that there were two different kinds of thinking going on. I would prefer to say ways of being, because it's not just cognitive, it's about a whole way of attending to the world and being in it. And I believe it emerged for a very good evolutionary reason that every creature to survive needs to get food and it needs to be able ultimately to do more than that so birds can build nests and 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 humans can build shelter and so on but effectively to manipulate the world and for that there is needed a very a, a tiny attention to detail um, but if that's the only kind of attention you pay, then you miss the predator, you miss your family, and, and you don't see the whole picture. So effectively, the left hemisphere, this is the first point to make, is not designed to help us understand the world. It's only designed to help us utilize it or manipulate it. And because of this particularistic, very narrow beam, precise attention to a detail, what it sees is a world made up of fragments, bits that are decontextualized, abstracted, categorized, um, inanimate effectively, and fixed so that they can be grabbed easily. By contrast, the right hemisphere sees a world in which nothing is atomistic because everything is ultimately connected to everything else, that it is moving, not fixed, that it is importantly what it is in a context, that context is often the body, um, and that everything is actually unique, not just an exemplar of a category. So you've got these two kinds of visions of the world vying. And I got interested in it first because I was studying literature, and I thought that one of the problems was that we took works of art that were implicit, embodied, individual, and worked on us in an embodied fashion, and instead um, turned them into abstractions that were you know, exemplified categories and had a meaning that was quite different once you took it out of context. Once you explain a poem as if you explain a joke, it's destroyed. So that's really just setting the scene to what I'm about to say, which is that 
I think that we have developed more and more a reliance on this left hemisphere way of thinking. And it's designed, as I say, not to understand, but to give you power. And that power becomes intoxicating, addictive. It becomes eventually the only way of seeing the world, that it is a world for our use, in which everything exists in order to be subjected to our utility. And all the other values, such as the beauty, the goodness, the truth, all these things are relegated. And I think in my lifetime, I've seen them even further relegated from their position, the position that Plato held they should occupy at the apex of the pyramid beneath the sacred. So that, that's what I think is going on. I think we're, we're becoming more and more taken with this abstracting, categorizing, um, very simplified way of thinking at the expense of all the rich stuff which we get through through art, through poetry, through music, through ritual, through narrative, through myth, all the things that can be expressed only in those ways get ignored by our culture. But unfortunately, they're all the stuff that would give it meaning. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts come up. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of um, named that this has happened over the last few centuries, uh, but it's very striking that, that the, um, what we call the scientific worldview embodies exactly the uh, ways of perceiving that you ascribe to the left brain, uh, the decontextualizing, mm. uh, the the um, inability to see things as unique, but merely as examples mm. of a category. Uh, scientific uh, ideology at its very foundation says that it says, for example, that that any two protons are identical. They are, they are merely members of a category and their differences are only because of the different forces that act upon them, but otherwise they are, they are generic. Uh, and, and it's not only physics or, or science that uh, narrates the world in this way, but it's also economics has, or econo you could say economics has created a world in the image of this way of perceiving by converting the uniqueness of each thing in the material world into commodities that um, are uh, ripped from their relational context. Uh, they're strip mined, you know, they're taken away from all of their relations and made into products that are, um, whose only relation is the price. The only relation to the consumer is the, is the price. So, so here we have, um, it's a kind of a feedback loop where the the these incredible powers that you speak of that have come from this left brain way of 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 engaging the world have created an environment that further encourages that way of relating to the world like the, the science and the technology that we've built so so right so it's not just like we had some you know bad idea and decided to use our left brains instead of you know our right brains for, for things but but yeah. we created an environment that encourages us to continue and intensify that uh i mean it seems yes. pretty a grim situation what do, what, do, what do we do to get out of that yes well I, I noticed in the piece that um you put up yesterday that i read with pleasure this morning that you talk about um the sort of hermetic nature of the system that it can't find material from outside but it gets surprising the more you put into it the more and more conformist and the less it actually sees of anything new you're talking about ai systems here and i think that is very interesting it's what i call the hall of mirrors the left hemisphere lives in a hall of mirrors in which its own representation its own theory about things is more important than any evidence that comes from the senses or from experience. And so it has no way of breaking out. And I, I, I say that in the past, we broke out of this hermetically sealed um, representation of the world um, through things that made the world presence to us, things like nature, um, the greatness of viscerally powerful art, the business of religion properly understood, not as a matter of propositions, but of a disposition towards the world, a proper understanding of the body. These things, we were 
they gave us intimations of something beyond whatever construct of an abstract kind the brain was um, currently producing. And what we find now, thank goodness, is, and I would say about science and economics, to sound a tiny note of optimism here, that um, economics has discovered that we don't just behave to maximize self-interest. Um, and therefore, the model homo economicus, which was employed for so long, led to um, complete disparity from what was actually going to happen. They predicted one thing and something else completely happened. Now, that may be partly that they're dealing with a very complex system, and complex systems are intrinsically unpredictable. But it's also that they misunderstood what motivates human beings, which is often to do things that are not immediately for their own interest, but are in some ways altruistic or other centered and in science too um, physics moved on about a hundred years ago from a mechanistic vision of the universe it just discovered that this simply didn't describe the universe that physics was con was uh, continually um revealing and what is exciting is that after biology started to do that in the early 20th century and then tailed off terribly badly in the second half by becoming entirely mechanistic and reductionist after the, the discovery that you could pretty much engineer things um, using um, molecules of DNA and so forth, that we now know that in fact living things, organisms are never of this kind. They're never fully predictable, they don't behave like machines, and they have completely different qualities from machines, thank goodness. So we, we, there are now signs amongst many biologists that we're recognizing that it's not just that machine that was wound up by an engineering god and that once it got going, all he had to do was occasionally oil the wheels, but that in fact it is intrinsically unpredictable intrinsically free and there's an interesting way we could go on all that and why it needs to be free but i'll just say that for now i'd just like to comment actually on the idea that one subatomic particle is identical to another i'm trying to think of the name of the physicist and think it might have been robert kelly i'm not quite sure but he he said that no two particles are actually identical Firstly, because they're connected differently, they're in a different context, inevitably, from any other particle. And, and also, because if nothing else, time has um, intervened, and we're now in a different universe. So connections, relationships make things what they are. You know, the, the, the way we believe that we can find out something by taking it apart is going to be very disappointing because things are what they are only because of the context they they're, they're found in. You can't discover what the heart is by viewing it in isolation. It's only when you see that it's differentiated seamlessly from the body that you know what it's there for. And so in the, in the new book, I actually argue that relations are prior to relata, are prior to the things that we think are related. They only emerge out of the web of relations. Yes. Yeah, I think that this this understanding is uh, arising uh, in many, many places, uh, that the idea, to paraphrase, that to exist is to relate. Um, and that, that and you know, to take quantum mechanics, for example, to, to say that something exists in the Cartesian sense of the world, you know, occupying a discrete place in space and time is nonsense in quantum mechanics. You can't say that it exists outside of you know, what they call a measurement, which, which is an interaction uh, between the observer yes. and the observed, or between the observer and the yes. system that is that yes. entangles it. Um, and, and we find that actually, you know. <laughs> on the very human level too, when, when you're cut off from, from rich and intimate relations with other people at the extreme, put into solitary confinement, uh, but or even for yeah. a few hours in a sensory isolation chamber, mm -hmm. like your, your beingness starts to decay. Or if you're lonely, you feel like you're mm -hmm. less in the world, like your, your existence mm -hmm. begins to fall apart. We, we keep mm. each other mm. here and we keep each other whole. Um, mm. and, and so even, you know, this has been one of the things I've, I've thought about and written about for many years, the, 
the defining sense of self in our civilization as a discrete separate unit. Um, it seems very intuitive to, to, I guess you might say a left brain way of thinking, but it is, and this is significant, it is no longer, um, that conception is no longer aligned with physics, it's no longer aligned with biology, um, it's no longer aligned with, with economics. You know, all of these seemingly objective foundations of what a self is are, are are crumbling from the inside and that in a way you know it's part of a of a awakening to sanity again because to think of yourself as something other than what you are is a form of insanity so we're you could say this is more optimism i guess that that we are um exiting the delusion which is um which presents all kinds of cognitive dissonance um, that can kind of come become its own kind of insanity like like this these these hammer blows to our story of what is and and who we are uh, can be kind of traumatic you know and people retreat maybe even more into the um, familiar narratives and and want to establish objective discrete uh you know newtonian cartesian beingness um the only thing i'd say um about that is that we need both union and division and in fact goethe who was an uncommonly wise man said that uniting the divided, dividing the united, this is the whole business of nature. And I think this is right. That, of course, if you fuse selves enough, and they all just become tools in a huge um, mechanistic society, such as the Soviet Union was, and that no doubt China probably is now, then the individual has lost all that uniqueness and all that capacity to contribute. And so you need to be able to preserve neither atomistic separation nor total fusion. This is true of most relationships, that they are best when they enrich one another. And in fact, we're enriched by the society out of which we come, and we can enrich the society in turn by what we give back to it. But each of those things is only possible because there is a distinction to be made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the story of the one and the many, which is a very important one, I think, and I have a whole chapter on it, um, we need both the idea of the one and the idea of the many. We mustn't fall into all is one or all is many on their own. Right. Yeah. That's that's. Um... <clears throat> yeah. I, I I don't have any argument about that. Um, no. 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 Yeah. I, maybe another thread I wanted to pull. Um, mm. let's see, you were talking about. Um, Gosh, I mean, there's so many, so many things that I resonate with. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. the, about you said of left brain, its own theory about things is more important than actual experience. Uh, that's something mm. that that has led in increasingly in recent years in um, mm. in politics to all kinds of of on the one hand, like all kinds of of conspiracy theories that that. Um, mm or I don't even want to call them conspiracy theories because they're, they're, it's a bigger category than that. They're, they're mm -hmm. like these alternate realities that usually mm -hmm. involve a conspiracy because otherwise, how could reality be so different than what we're being told? But their essence mm -hmm. is not actually conspiracy. They're, they're, they're like these completely, um, uh, these alternate timelines, you know, these alternate histories, uh, these alternate, mm -hmm. that go along with alternate physics, you know, breakaway civilizations, um mm. uh uh extraterrestrial politics you know and i'm not actually wanting to dismiss these as mere conspiracy theories i, I see them on a mythic level that that mm. who where, where their objective fact is sometimes less important than the truth that rides their vehicle but but you know people get wrapped up in these very convoluted um mm. uh alternate realities and the thing that 
that the people who dismiss them out of hand do not recognize is that from the inside, they are self-consistent. It's not that people are are stupid and not clever enough mm. uh, and, and, and mm. you know, cognitively impaired, and that's why they believe that the earth is flat. If you go into that mythology, it is it can account for every data point. Uh, and even Occam's razor cannot always distinguish uh, what's, what is, uh, you know, a, a valid narrative and what isn't. Um, and so, so mm. this, but, but, but these are only maintainable in a kind of an isolation. And then I would extend that to the polarized, mm. I'll, I'll finish in just a second here, the, the, the polarized opinion tribes that um, have come out in the mainstream as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. To, yeah. To, I mean, the, when we talk about madness, I mean, one of the things is that there are very obviously impossible things that are being um, put about as the absolute truth that mustn't be questioned. And when you're in that state, you're in a totalitarian state, as Hannah Arendt pointed out. She said, when there are things that you can't even question, then you're in the totalitarian state. And I think one of the you know, points you made at the outset was violence and, and anger and so on. And I think there's two ways of looking at this, that in some ways, the more improbable the position you're trying to assert is, the more you have to silence any possible opposition and be very angry about it. Because if the opposition was allowed to say anything reasonable, it would destroy your argument. So there's a lot of investment in maintaining certain positions. And once they become the positions that are the mainstream opinion, whether it's in Lenin's Russia or in England in 2023, woe betide you if you don't stick to this, because this is how people exert power. It's how bureaucracies flourish. They look at the way bureaucracies are taking over all the professions that things that would have rooted us in some kind of a reality would be the intactness of a tradition which we've taught to be only ashamed of and to destroy the um the intactness of a family religion the professions the doctor the teacher all the these things yeah. have been systematic community these have all been systematically attacked localism you know all these things have been pushed out of the way partly for capitalist economic reasons and partly for reasons of just being able to totally control and, and it's this desire for total total control that i think is now the key element in our in our situation and again, Hannah Arendt said that when people feel completely powerless, which I think a lot of people do to make any difference to this, they turn to violence. And so we're in a situation that can incubate that violence unless we begin to make it very, very clear that freedom to speak and to be honest is of essential importance. You never find intellectuals querying that because, again, it might upset the narrative that they're keen to peddle. But there is no narrative we should be peddling. We should be trying to look honestly at what the truths are, and then we can react to that with compassion and do the right thing. Whereas at the moment, because everyone's narcissistically getting angry and passionate about their particular um, be in their bonnet, it's very hard to have that conversation at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, so, so um, this um, mania for control. Yeah. Uh, and, and to protect the narrative, to protect the, 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 the conceptual world that we've become lost in that drifts. Exactly. Uh, because it's hermetically sealed, I mean, I'm exaggerating, from from actual input from outside of itself, uh, it yeah. drifts further and further away from from reality. And and exactly. locked within it, we do things that are um, horrible to life in the name mm. of progress. Uh, and, and so the... the That's it. Yeah, so the censorship that that is all around us today is it, it, it's it's necessary to maintain the integrity of that uh, world reality story bubble. 
because it becomes yes. more uh, and more vulnerable to to assault. More and more, I mean, more and more and vulnerable to common sense. <laughs> you know, well, indeed, that very 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 rare thing to meet these days. But w one of the things I feel about it, which may sound a little bit extreme, is that there are drives that human human lives are susceptible to negotiating certain value driven drives. Freud thought there were drives, Jung thought there were drives, and I believe that the left hemisphere's lust for power embodies a drive. And one of the reasons I'm not so sure about the um, paranoid um, conspiracy theories is that it, it, it suggests that there are people who really know what they're doing and are controlling this. But my, right. my view is that actually they may think they're in control of what they're doing, but they're actually themselves going to be eaten up by this um, Leviathan, which is this enormous drive towards power. And, and they can't escape it any more than we can, but we're locked into this. And what it will breed is ever more layers of administration and managerialism to, to cut us off from contact with life itself. I mean, where, where can the young any longer find the sort of spontaneity the kind of joie de vivre that I remember having when I was young. Nowadays, everything is so remote. It all has to be done through interfaces on some screen, and you have to watch exactly what you say and what you do. My God, this is, this is an attack on life itself. We need to fight back for life because we're not. We're not just um, um, inferior computers or superior computers. We're not computers at all. And what worries me about the expansion of AI, and, of AI is as much the way in which we're becoming like machines as the way machines may be becoming like humans. I don't believe they are, actually. I just think they're becoming expressions of this tyrannical will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wrote an essay, I think it was last year, that, that was on this theme too, the, the robot who wanted to be a man. Uh, and that made the point that we're becoming more and more like robots. And one reason why it's so easy to yes. replace to replace human functions with with AI is that human functioning has become more and more mechanical. So it's of course absolutely. It's, you know, it's very easy to to uh, artificially generate text that is um, uh, trite and and cliched and um, unimaginative you know, and just a lowest common denominator generic example of what everybody else is doing. Like you can, like it's, we've already become very mechanical for the same reason that, uh, for, based on the same principles that these large language models operate on, um, which, which is, you know, they 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 um, study what already is uh, and they're yes. locked in, they can't get outside of the internet. Uh, okay. And and but we we can theoretically, but we haven't been. We've become more and more self-referential, and more and more detached from the the mystery, from the source of infinite and uncontrollable experience. And and as we migrate into this bubble, we become more and more comfortable there. And it seems more and more that you can control everything, like on a on a. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're generating an image, you know, on a screen, you can designate where every pixel goes. And if your lived experience is that everything you see is on a screen, it suggests that you can hey, you can control mm. those pixels, you can control the world because the world shows you up can as do pixels. anything. Yes. Yes. It's and, the fulfillment of a nerd's dream to be able to control right. everything and be and do anything. And it's this that is, I mean, it was all said by Hannah Arendt long before computers became a part of our lives. So it's not as though it just originates with AI. I think AI is being used by this particular drive. And it's intensifying accelerating the process, yeah. intensifying right. it enormously. And I think that we have become less imaginative. I mean, it, it, it's a commonplace that science has become much less imaginative over the last 50 years compared with the previous 50 years in which it really made enormous strides. And I think the arts too, with many, you know, notable exceptions, have become more samey, more to do with um, being clever and less to do with communicating these ancient deep things that really in a way I mean, <laughs> perhaps we, we can't at this stage in a conversation bring in the concept of the divine and the sacred, but to me they are 
hugely important in our way of conceiving what we are and what the world is and what our duties to it are and what our relationships with it are and what our imagination should be doing. I, I think that it's also hugely important. I mean, because that's one name that we can put on the infinite mystery that eludes capture uh, by our concepts and categories. Um, there's two ways I want to go right now. One is I kind of wanted to just say one more thing about conspiracy theories. Um, interestingly, the 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 left brain worldview that sees total control as possible is also susceptible to seeing a cabal of of world controlling conspiracy. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's part of that same way of thinking. It's, um, it's constantly paranoid. I mean, right. this is one of the, the features of the left hemisphere. It must have total control, because if it doesn't, other people have power, and what are they going to do? And it, so it's no, um, just mention this, and uh, sorry, but when people have damage to the right hemisphere, they become paranoid. They start to have paranoid delusions. Um, and, and in fact, schizophrenia is, which is famous for having such delusions, is largely a, a sort of hemis a right hemisphere deficit state. Anyway, uh, I didn't yeah. want to interrupt you well, too the, much the other there, thing, but though, I, I, I mean, that was kind of an aside. The other thing that I'm just really resonating with, and I'm sure people listening are too, is like you said something like we have to fight for life. You know, it's it's like mm. this exuberance of being alive that constantly challenges the confines that that we have constructed around ourselves like the dandelions bursting through the cracks in the parking lot life wanting to live yes. uh that's yes and yes. and tapping into the infinity you know, you named the, the sacred that which is another name for the mystery for the for the infinite that eludes capture uh and exactly i, I think that that the this is part of what this whole sanity project is about it's to to validate our innate knowledge that yes there is something outside of the matrix and, and yes. that it's not like some distasteful relic of a superstitious past. You know, I, I remember one time I, I was on a speaking tour and I was supposed to speak at Oslo University um, about economics. And I titled the talk Sacred Economics because that was the name of my book. And the whole book is about um, really uh, um, transcending the regime of quantity ultimately, and the conversion yep. of values yep. into value, you know, like, and Absolutely. the sacred being the unnameable, the qualitative, uh, the ungraspable. Yep. Well, they canceled, the university canceled the talk because they're like, well, we're, um, yeah, we're a rational, you know, we don't, we don't do this, the, this religious what? stuff, you know. Yeah, that's outrageous. That's, that's outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> and then I gave the talk. Have actually, they been sufficiently... <laughs> I, have, have they been fought back against for this? This was years ago. It was 20, I think it was 2016. I ended up giving the talk in, like oh, this, co okay. in this co-working space that was just really, it was actually, um, you know, I have actually tr trouble speaking in university spaces. You know, it's like mm. stepping into a hostile environment and I start to feel defensive and I start to want to yeah. uh, legitimize yeah. myself by adopting yes. some of their language and, and then I become like, you know, I, I just don't feel myself, and I, yeah. I and and my pipeline to the, to the source, yeah, yeah. to the infinite source, is is constricted. Mm. So it was actually all for the yeah, best. Yeah. But but you know, just a mm. case in mm. point that that like I welcome you bringing this into the conversation, uh, like you know, the sacred God, the divine, um, mm. and and it is offensive to the modern mind steeped in left brain thinking it's offensive to the mind because it it names the uh unnameable you know it it yes. impugns the, the the constructed uh belief system that in which the the left brain is comfortable yes i mean one of the things that you mentioned earlier was the triumph of the scientific reductionist materialism um, but not just in science, across our philosophy of what it means to be alive. And in that system, um, a lot of people believe that science has proved that there is no purpose, and science has proved that there are no values, that they're just things we invent. I believe powerfully that they're not things we invent, but things that we discover, i.e. they're there to be discovered, if we can, 
or, or if we can't. They, that, so what we need to do is to be open to them. And they can't have said anything of the kind because science begins from ruling out all considerations of purpose or value because perfectly legitimately it wants to understand mechanisms and it wants to see how things work, as it were. So it, 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 it forbids talk about them, but it can't then announce that it has discovered <laughs> that there are no values and there is no purpose because it's what they themselves decreed. There's a nice little thing in C.S. Lewis where he says, it's like a policeman stopping all the traffic in the street and then solemnly noting in his notebook, the silence in this street is very suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a that's an amazing metaphor. Wow. Yeah, because they, 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 it's like, let us hypothesize that everything real can be measured and quantified. Mm. And then they build up this this world in which there is nothing that cannot be measured and quantified, that anything that is unmeasurable yeah. does not exist. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's so facto, it's proven. Um, and really what yes. it is, I mean, I look at science as a religion, and this is one of its metaphysical underpinnings. Yes. Um, it can't be a religion. It's not what it's there for. It has very important use, but it, it shouldn't take on roles that it's it's never designed for but nowadays it's taken over our way of thinking so that you know i just want to come back to the idea of beauty and goodness and truth these things that have been so so undermined so travested so contradicted in 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 my lifetime and that these are the ways these are the lights that can lead us out of this this mess. I used to feel rather skeptical about Dostoevsky's line, the world will be saved by beauty. Mm. Um, partly because I know that there are things that are superficially beautiful that are not in themselves good. Um, but I've come more and more to the idea that actually, at least it can act as a leading light. Things that are truly beautiful, are powerful and call to us. And we know when something is is true in a way. We we need we need to trust our intuitions more. I mean, the, the trouble with trusting algorithms and rules and explicit procedures is that, as I say, all the stuff that is important is not expressible in that form. That's why we have poetry and music and dance and and theater and and, and narratives and, and and religious rituals. I mean, these things are very important. And the Greeks saw that. Mythos was one of the paths to truth, and the other was Logos. And initially, they thought Mythos, the origin of our word myth, was more important than Logos, that it was the only thing that would reveal the big truths, that Logos was the kind of petifodding kind of reasoning that you do with an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mythos, Logos. Truth, beauty, beauty, you know, is one of my main operating principles. Um, my my uh, no. best known book was called The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know It's Possible. And I propose that as an orienting mm -hmm. principle uh, when, especially when our, our notion of what truth is has kind of collapsed into uh, objective fact. Um, mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, which I, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but but just to say, you know, I'm not sure if if there if it's really true when you really go into it, if there are beautiful things that are harmful to the world. I mean, there are kind of gaudy substitutes for beauty that we've become hypnotized mm -hmm. into associating with that mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I, you know, some of the videos I've been making for this this uh, program uh, are about. I took one in. It was in uh, Union Station in Washington, D.C. I could have taken yeah. it. I, I, are you, have you been in that building before? I have. I have it's a train station, right? Like it's got like, a, I don't know, a 70 or 80 foot high ceiling. It's uh, yeah. it's these gorgeous proportions, the 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 the, the stonework. I mean, the, the, the it is beautiful. And you can't, mm. I don't even think that we have the capacity to make something like that today. It's it's because it's not reducible to any set of principles. And even if you reconstructed it uh, stone for stone, 
it wouldn't be the same because of the relational mm -hmm. quality of being. Uh, and mm -hmm. in the essay that that I published last night, um, you know, I made the point like the Mona Lisa was a very unsold painting, but that is a product of its context. And if you just make endless copies of it, those are not going to have the quality of soul. It's it so beauty is an emergent function, and it cannot be mm -hmm. copied. It has to come from the infinite, and that's why I think that it is such a liberatory orienting principle. Uh, it's because of its irreducibility. And, and when you're just shuffling the bits, which is what AI does, mm -hmm. and to a large extent what our culture does. I mean, how many movies are just mm -hmm. sequels of other movies, cannibalizing mm -hmm. our, our cultural legacy? You know, uh, when, when, mm -hmm. when, you, when you are cut off from, from life, from the, from the infinity of, of being, um, then mm -hmm. you just end up recycling things and beauty is lost because beauty... Mm -hmm is um contextual you know it has to draw from something outside of what already is yes of course that's i would agree with that i mean it's interesting and rather mystifying isn't it what happens and when things are copied and often it's because they're copied extremely badly um and, and something important is degraded in the process i mean almost all copies of things are degraded versions of what was first there. Mm -hmm. But you're right that nothing can substitute for the immediate relationship in which one is awestruck by the yeah. beauty of something in its in its presence. Th that that reminds me of this difference between the presencing of something which is always real and vibrant and awe inspiring and the representation of it. And this is a distinction between the right and left hemisphere. The right hemisphere is what enables us to allow things to presence, mm -hmm. as Heidegger would have put it. But I mean, what I'm talking about there is the kind of thing you can feel if you practice mindfulness and you, you stop the chatter and you try to just be there embodied in that place and see it for the first time. And that is something that requires imagination, something no machine can do. It's dealing only with representations. And so the mechanical reproduction of the things creates more of this um, dead, effectively, um, world. I mean, just out of interest, because these brain things are not always known by people, but if you suppress the right uh, frontal cortex, people actually start to see um, living things as inanimate. They start seeing um, people as kind of zombies and... Whereas if you do the opposite and suppress the left frontal cortex, they start to see things that wouldn't normally be considered animate as animate. So they, they see the sun and they see it moving in the sky and they see this as a, a living thing. I um, love how anyway. you said, I love how you said they see things that wouldn't ordinarily be considered as animate, uh, as animate. You didn't say <laughs> they see inanimate things as animate. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because... Well, Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the sun were, is animate, actually. The, well, there were important traditions in many civilizations, as well as in indigenous cultures where people have animistic beliefs yeah. that hold this to be true. And Rupert Sheldrake, who, whatever else people may say about him, is not a negligible scientist, has written yeah. a paper on the fact that the sun is a living being. I wrote, I wrote an essay on that, too, that drew from that paper. Um, yeah, I mean, really? sun, really? yeah, yeah. It yeah. was. I can't remember what I called it. It was. It was again last year, but it was about the uh, the homeostatic feedback loops uh, that that maintain the sun and and the uh, the complexity of its electromagnetic stable and yes. stable patterns. You know that that are very similar to those of the brain. I mean, it it, it is mm. irrational to dismiss the idea that the sun is alive and intelligent. I, I think so. I mean, I, I argue, in fact, in the book um, that along with the philosopher Robert Rosen, who I think is very, very interesting, that inanimacy is just the limit case of animacy. In other words, animacy is the norm in the cosmos. And inanimacy is when that animacy is reduced 
so far that we call it inanimate, but it's actually an asymptote that is never fully reached. Mm -hmm. So the the cosmos is alive, I believe, and conscious. I know these things sound um, rather strange or woo-woo like to some people, but I mean, I have written about it at great length and explained why I believe these things. So this this is the issue, though, like like even the like this kind of need to offer a little bit of a disclaimer or a little bit of a caveat. Well, yes. I know it sounds woo woo, you know, like <laughs> that is part of the repudiation of what's actually true. Uh, and I know, I know. It's like related to what I do if I'm speaking at a university auditorium, you know, and I'm like, okay, I better be careful yes, to, yes. to 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 yes. uh, demote some of these ideas a little yes. bit just so that I'm yes. acceptable. Yes. Yes. Uh, but I feel like we need to embrace yes. them, you know, because this is part of the yes, gaslighting. I, I call it auto yes. gaslighting. I know. Yeah. You know, no, like, absolutely right. And here we are together. We're compliant with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and then, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. And then, like, then we end up gaslighting others because, like, if I, mm. if I say, well, you know, I'm not a new ager, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to mm. to really believe in this woo woo thing, uh, <laughs> then the people who secretly are like, but I think the sun is alive, but I think Earth is alive, mm. but I think the cosmos is conscious. Um, I think that we have to, what the, the, the motto of our program is sanity is a group project. And these, these countercultural beliefs that are based mm. on a larger perception um, and a more open yes. perception of the world that, that you associate with the right brain, um, these are hard to hold by ourselves in against yes. the onslaught of culture and yes. economics and law and social yes. pressure you know yes. and that's why we're here no we're here to establish an island of sanity um so th that, I'm that's wonderful really grateful yes. for you you know bringing this in <laughs> no no and i i think you you know much as i said we need division and union but we need them to be unified um we we need we need to have boundaries to what we I mean, there is such a thing as beliefs that are woo. You referred to some yeah. earlier that you call possible conspiracy theories. Um, but there are things that, as it were, are so unlikely, in taking into account everything else we know, that we can say we don't believe those. Yeah. But nothing is, nothing is necessarily wrong. We need to listen and think and not be dismissive and judgmental before we've thought something through. But provided one remains yeah. skeptical up to a point. But I mean, I, I believe that, you know, we need to be skeptical of the people who are skeptics as well. So skepticism needs to be applied there as well. <laughs> and if it does, it, if you're skeptical of skepticism, in the end, you open up a path to some kind of a truth, which I think is calling to us all the time. And probably better when, when we're together than when we're apart, because we're less susceptible to this gaslighting that you refer to. I'm going to bring one more thing in, and then uh, maybe we'll uh, mm. take some questions from the audience. Um, sure. You know, I was, okay, so like, you said some things actually are woo woo, and so I picked up this piece of shungai here, you know, um, and I'm like, okay, what would be woo woo? Would be to um, project human intelligence or human consciousness or human aliveness yeah, onto it. something that does. It. So it's like anthropomorphizing. Um, yes, yes. But I do think that it's, it, it's not that. Yeah. It's not that there's a little person trapped inside the piece of structure right. uh, that, that can't get out and can't, you know, that, that right. would be a terrible way to think. No. Right. And that, that way of thinking of it, um, you know, it does tap into a genuine intuition that, that yes. everything is, is sacred, everything is alive in some sense. Um, mm -hmm. But it, then mm -hmm. it gets hijacked by the very kind of left brain representational thinking that that you're mm. that you're uh, illuminating here um which is always mm. a reduction representation is always mm. reduction it's a compaction mapping that makes the world exactly. smaller and smaller and smaller and yeah. here we are together yeah. to um liberate ourselves and each other from that prison and yes. be fully alive yes. again um, that's it so we, we need to yeah do you want to add to that? Life, I'll, I'll call on on some uh, embodiment and honor the sacred, because these are the things that will lead us uh, uh, back towards 
a, a greater sanity. Okay, so yeah, there's more I could say about about even like what well, we could talk is talk for a very long time. I've yeah. no doubt, Charles. It would be lovely. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Let me let me uh, go to gallery view here and. Um, mm. Patsy, I might need help from you. Yes, to totally. Um, we need. Review. So today, yes. what we're going to do, because we have a lot of people uh, raising their hands. Um, therefore, ch what Charles is going to do is he's going to tune in to the audience uh, and then he'll pick someone. So we won't be picking in any particular order, but him tuning in. So Charles, if you can't see gallery view, you should. Oh, I, I got it. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, uh, I can see gallery view. Awesome. I saw some like, little hearts come up. That was really nice. Yeah. Um, oh, that's nice. Yes. I haven't seen any hands yet. I'm just scrolling through here. Of course, I've got lots of hands in my gallery view. I don't oh, know why. why. Do, you want to pick, do you want to pick one? Well, I, on what principle, I don't know. Just random. I, in that case, I'm going to just Susan Stedman. You've got a hand raised. Uh, how do we unmute you? I need help here from um, yeah, Patsy. Olson. Patsy. Yeah, I'll I'll take care of that. Okay, I'm on okay. Mute. Okay, just <laughs> a second. I'm going to put Susan up. Yeah. Hello, doctor. Thank you so much for being here. Um, mm. My question is um, on page two fifty five. You're talking about the. Um, <laughs> kind of blind spot in the, in, in the right and left hemispheres. And um, right. and I was, you know, I was going along with it and it all worked for me until you said something really startling. And I was, I was wanting you to explain that. Um, yeah, sure. Um, you say, um, you're talking about the right hemisphere. It grounds the natural viewpoint of the self unreflecting being in the world. It therefore cannot sufficiently on its own disengage itself from the natural viewpoint. And then you say, um, and this is the part that threw me, the trouble is that the more natural its view seems to it, the less it is really allowing the extraordinary awe-inspiring fact of the being of anything at all to be present for us. Thus it risks mm -hmm. in its own way lapsing into the in inauthenticity of Heidegger's Verfallen. In this state, mm -hmm. it is the left hemisphere that enables the willful taking up of an unnatural view. And then you, you talk about um, the left hemisphere being the vertical axis and the right hemisphere being the horizontal axis. And that's what threw me because in my way of thinking, mm -hmm. the, um, right hemisphere is what gets us, what it, it's the, it's what allows us to feel yeah. awe and wonder. And, and it's, yes, yes. you know, uh, Richard Rohr talks about the emotional body being a direct access to spirit. Yeah. And so I always think of the right hemisphere as being the vertical axis, not the horizontal one. Yes. So that's what really threw me. Yes, it, it, you're, you're in many ways entirely right. The difficulty with any such metaphor is that you need to be clear about the way in which it's understood, and I obviously didn't make it clear enough there. But what I was talking about is that the left hemisphere has a rather remote um, view, as one would have looking at a map of the world, seeing it all laid out below you, but not really experiencing it, not being there on the terrain. So it has an idea of the territory from its aerial view, like a drone but it doesn't actually have the on the ground lived experience of being there in the terrain. I make a distinction between the territory and the terrain. And that was what I intended, but you're quite right that um, the, the right hemisphere has to balance two things, being there and understanding the unique far better than the left hemisphere, but also seeing the whole much better than the left hemisphere. Yeah. So then would- Thank you very much for, for raising that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about, oh, Samantha Sweetwater's got her hand raised. Oh, boy. This is going to be good. No pressure, Samantha. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, hey, not that everybody is good. Um, <laughs> thank yeah, you. Let's, let's get Samantha uh, <laughs> unmuted here. Yeah, yeah. Just a second. Okay. I'm trying. Yeah. Hey, um, someone, can someone 
I need Samantha and I'm trying to uh, exchange the spotlighting. Somehow the button, okay, remove spotlighting and Samantha. I so can't see the, the speaker oh, at all. Are. Just a second. I, I don't know if I'll show up if there I... There you are. There you are. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Could you just say again what you just said? Oh, hello. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Hello. Hello. Right. Okay. Well, that's all right. You can say that as many times as you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for... Um, for inviting me on this call, Charles and Ian, it's such a joy to be here with you. I'm a recent, I've recently discovered your work through Daniel Schmachtenberger and um, my experience of the work has, of, of your work has been an intense validation of my own life path, which has been a path of embodied facilitation, mostly in community as a critique to what we cannot do from the cushion. So in my 20s, I, I realized that there were, there were many horizons we, um, in terms of shared sanity that we couldn't actually address through spiritual practices oriented towards self-reference. And that's been my life, my life path for 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So my, my question is this, and I, I, the way I think of um, intuitively, this is an, this is intuitive, having not yet had the time to fully dive into your work. But intuitively, I think of right brain and embodied and relational practices as as the the place where they find their fit. You know, from from the brain's perspective, and then also from the perspective of body, mind, and relationship. And I, I would really love to hear you speak to how you think about embodiment or the practices that engage us in embodied connection to ourselves, others, nature as path, as a path to reattuning to the right brain. And in a way, I'm asking mm. this from a perspective of re reverse engineering because I see my life very much as a journey of working to stay in my mm. right brain and bring others to mm. their right brain. <laughs> and and I, from from your mm. perspective, both as philosopher and neuroscientist, how do you see the connection between, I, you could say, sanity and embodiment? Mm. Um, well, and what, how do you think of the role of the body in um, in in becoming more sane well uh, in the world that we live in at the moment we've become over abstracted over conceptual and and cease to attend to what our bodies say to us including not just i mean that sounds that they might be saying rather low level things but they may be saying very high level and important things to us um, there's a, an amazing complex of neurons in the gut and around the heart, but also the right hemisphere is more in touch with the rest of the body, quite literally, and has an image of the body. So the left hemisphere tends to take everything out and be, make it abstracted. And so anything that we can do that brings us back to this more grounded, embodied, you know, here I am, this living flesh and blood creature on the planet, it's good, and it, these can be many, many practices. You don't need me to tell you that. They, they can be spiritual practices. They can be to do with the arts or music or dance or whatever. But it's 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 trying to get away from the idea that we're cognitive beings. We're brains in a vat. We're far cleverer than any cognitive being would be because we have intuitions, and intuitions can tell us many things that we could reason um, until we were dead without having discovered. So, but the, the trouble is at the moment we're being, it's all part of the um, war, in my view, on nature and the body, is that we're being told to disattend to our intuitions um, by clever psychologists who've got examples, which are undeniably the case, where our intuitions deceive us. But that's, that's because most of the time they do such a very good job. You can invent a situation in which you, you, you don't. But, but, you know, that's like optical illusions. If you can, I can show you an optical illusion so good you can't believe it. But I don't think I ever heard anyone say, well, from now on, after seeing that, I'm just going to live my life with my eyes closed. So I think we need to rediscover our embodied being 
And thank you for, for, for raising that. I don't think I've given much of an answer, but anyway, there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, Samantha's going to be um, uh, a, a guest on the uh, on the um, program later on. Um, okay, cool. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Let me go back to gallery view and see what I can find. Jonathan Putnam is would you okay, like to sounds speak? Sounds good. Or? Yeah. Okay, just give me a second to find him because um, here we are. Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks for this talk and, and thanks for just a great book. Uh, I was really curious. I was reading this book and I've got, you know, I put all these sticky notes that I wound up like just kind of putting in. And I, I was really curious as I was, you know, obviously it's just a very comprehensive, like, you know, the, the bibliography and footnotes are like 100 pages. Uh, of, and I'm curious, how did you actually go about organizing over time? You know, you know, do you have file cabinets? I mean, do you have, I'm just kind of curious about how you were able to develop the mm. structure of the outline and, mm. and, and, and kind of pull these pieces together from so many, you know, everything from philosophers to scientific papers. How were you able to, you know, mm. organize that? With difficulty. Um, <laughs> and, I can imagine. Uh, yes, but partly because um, it's focused on, on on ideas, philosophical c concepts, really. And so they form a kind of node around which neuroscientific findings can be grouped. And I had many different, um, I had something like 60 to 70 um, areas, as it were. And when I found something very interesting, I made a note of it and put it in a file that had the name of that conceptual area. So in the end, I ended up with all these 60 files. And I didn't know where to begin because, you know, if I wanted to explain A, I had to explain B. If I wanted to explain B, I had to explain C. But if I wanted to explain C, I had to explain A. So, you know, it was like a, uh, and I despaired of it. I, in fact, went into therapy in the end. So why can't I write this book that I'm so keen to write? And I never got an answer, but I did write the book. So that was perhaps the therapy working. <laughs> But it was difficult. And I found it actually easier to write this um, latter book, even though it's much longer. But that's partly because I was actually still working 60 hours a week when I wrote um, The Master and His Emissary, whereas I wasn't when I wrote The Matter of Things. Thank you. Thanks. OK, let's see. We can find someone else here. By the way, just if I can add a sentence to what I just said. In the end, I had to trick myself into writing it by writing what I thought was just a skeleton draft of 20 pages. And it ended up being 1,200 pages. So in the process, I actually wrote the book. And I went to dinner with a friend who I wanted to read the draft, whose opinion I greatly admired. And after dinner, I handed over a, a, a supermarket carrier bag with the 1,200 pages in. And it still had a header that said, draft of an outline of the master and his emissary. And he just looked in the bag and said, some outline. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm having... For some reason, I'm not seeing any hands raised. That cannot be. Why am I? Omer Ilem or Omer Elam? Mm -hmm. how, how do you pronounce it? Can you unmute yourself? Uh, uh, which person? The first? Uh, o Omer, Omer, okay. Here, let me. Yes. I, yeah, it's Elam. Um, Elam. Thanks for the very interesting discussion. I want to go back to one of the points you were both mentioning at some point and kind of go, if you could elaborate a bit further on that. And I think that was when Charles, you mentioned that we're talking about AI and that actually what is happening is the process of society or people becoming much more robotic. And I think I've, I've always had, or always, for many years, I've had this idea of actually when speaking of artificial intelligence, 
we call it artificial intelligence, but actually what lies behind it is a lot of natural ignorance, which is kind of like the mirror image of it, exactly. because there's nothing artificial about it. It's what we invest in it. What it is is what, is what we invest in it. And what we see from the outputs of all of these large language models is a lot of ignorance because we basically treat them without sufficient consciousness, without appreciating what they are. So going back into this idea of, well, that at least partly we can see this trend in society becoming much more robotic. And I was wondering, like, if we, if we did take this idea to the extreme, then we can even think, which is a kind of a terrible thought, but I think it's one we, we have to, to come to, to, to uh, address is that what, what if what we are seeing is in a way a kind of speciation event, which is non-biological, but that some part of humanity is becoming something else. Hmm. Right? Is that your thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a, in, a way, like, in a way, I think you can say that in some ways we are also, and I think that's also related to the destruction of the natural world. So in a way, we are destroying the natural world and migrating into a virtual world that we are creating. So what if there is a speciation and some part of humanity <laughs> is doing this migration while other people are resisting this <laughs> migration process? Yeah, I, I've thought about that a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll respond first and then see what Ian has to add to it. Um, sure. Um, you know the 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 products of the human mind uh, feed back into the evolution of the human mind. Uh, so it's entirely mm. plausible that that the the creations that that are um, the product of the uh, uh, dominance of the left brain or the 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 um, the particular use that we're putting the left brain to in at the expense of the right brain themselves will contribute to the atrophy of of right brain functions you know that that start with just mere disuse but then end up getting uh encoded uh into the epigenetics and maybe eventually into the germline you know and eventually we have um uh, evolution happens a lot faster than biology traditionally understood because mm. mm. um as one biologist I talked to a while ago said, everyone's a Lamarckian now. Uh, the the, mm. the the um, yep. uh, uh, the conditions in which we live feed into our evolution, uh, not only through random mutation. So, the, and this is actually related to another theme that Ian and I were 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 just kind of dancing at the edge of, uh, which is when when Ian said that we um, we discover. Uh, meaning, I'm not sure if, it was, if that's the word you use, but we discover meaning rather than creating meaning. Uh, that that mm. uh, order and organization and 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 in some sense meaning and purpose is inherent in creation. I mean, we see this mm. from from you know the Mandelbrot set, for example. Like like it's it's just like that. <laughs> you know, we didn't no artist invented this thing. Um, so so this this. So it's almost like there's there are these um, attractor states uh, to human beings, exactly. to the human species, that we could go to, toward one or to another, and or maybe to both. Maybe there's a speciation. Um, and the one thing I would add to that is that this future, this timeline, this attract the 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 result of which attractor state we go to is it one where the left brain completely takes over and and we are in this arms race against reality to to create better and better systems of control uh, that we need more and more because we've cut ourselves off so much, like like more and more uh, 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 technology in the human body to constantly monitor our physiology in order to make the interventions that we no longer can make ourselves because we've been so cut off from the microbiome, et cetera, et cetera. Like like there's um, or these cognitive crutches that we're going to need, like you stop using your your uh, imagination 
and you need images created from the outside. You know, you stop using your your uh, ability to to do the things that chat GPT is doing, and then you need chat GPT, and the brain conforms around that. Like, so there is an attractor mm -hmm. state, I think, where we become uh, marooned in the world of concepts, but never actually fully cut off from it. There's always, um, there's always a choice to be made that goes on a different branch and toward a different attractor. Mm. And so this is what I wanted to, to uh, end with, uh, you know, that, that we have a choice in the matter and we're making this choice right now. It's not like a random outcome, whether we end up uh, as this species or that species or bifurcating. So yeah, Ian, thoughts on that? Mm. Well, I think there is an attractor. I think that values attract us to certain ends. What worries me is that the only value at the moment is that of power. And it's a very attractive um, force for some people. And what concerns me is that in itself, it will degrade what a human being is. Um, and there are a whole lot of vicious circles involved. One is the one you refer to, that AI, the bigger part it comes to play, the more and more it draws only on what it itself has created. This is something that the left hemisphere specializes in, is only recognizing what it itself has created. It's a, it's a distinction I, I avert to in both the, the, the main books. And that in doing so, we, the, the, the living part of us, which is the part that acknowledges life and embodiment and the life of the spirit and all the subtlety that makes life worth living will be atrophied because we won't be using it. And this other way of thinking will dominate. And because, of course, that will atrophy, we will have less and less when you talk about the choice. There will be less and less left for us to use to get back there. I mean, of course, it won't happen overnight, and so there will effectively be choices. But ultimately, this is a very dangerous thing to be playing with. And in almost every tradition around the world, there, there are myths about people who are seduced by the desire for material things or for power. I mean, it's one of the most common and, and how this leads everyone to destruction, not just the person, but often those around them as well. So I think we ought to take it extremely seriously. And, and I would say artificial intelligence is a misnomer. It's got nothing to do with intelligence. It's a, I call it artificial stupidity because it is artificial and it is very stupid. Um, and however clever it gets at mimicking intelligence, it will never be intelligence. You know, in the in the 18th century, we started off with machines that looked like people and moved a hand and so on. We've got much, much more sophisticated, but we're still on the other side of the chasm that separates the representation from the real thing. Thank you both. Yeah, that that the misnomer that you're speaking of artificial intelligence it really does come down to mistaking the representation for the thing. Um, yes. The imitation of intelligence for intelligence. And it's a pretty good yes. imitation depending on where you look. Um, yep. People have yep. trouble. And it's going to get better. Yeah. Yeah. No, they really will. I mean, already, I think it's getting more difficult because there are fifth and sixth iterations of whatever chat GPT is that are apparently um, far more sophisticated than chat GPT. And people will begin to, I don't know what, it, 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 well, we won't go there because it'll take too long. We need to ask some questions, but I think it will have um, damaging effects on almost every aspect of our lives. Right. I mean, we won't be able to, to trust anything on a screen no. anymore, but that might be a good it, thing. Exactly. Because, you know, now, now we're only going to trust things that are embodied. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I tend to be That's optimistic. True. <laughs> but, but here's another yeah, interesting thing. <laughs> Here's the, that that relates to the point about beauty being contextual and and mm. um, that that suppose hey everybody how can you be sure that this whole conversation was not the product of uh, synthetic art, artificial intelligence that 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 these are not yes. th this is yes. not a deep fake of Ian McGilchrist yes um, yes who's yes. saying <laughs> words that are. Uh, generated by a large language model that comprises all of his work. 
how do you know that? The, the, and I think you can know that. It might take, mm. when these technologies become very highly developed, it might take some time and attention to know it. But the way that you would know it is you'd be listening to this and you'd be like, this is all stuff I've heard before. I've heard them all <laughs> say it before. You know, in one way or another, maybe in slightly in like distorted form, but it's all something I've heard before. But but what but I'm I'm quite sure that I mean maybe early in our conversation you were saying things you have said a lot in other contexts, but I'm sure that something has emerged in our conversation. Mm. The, and this was the intention I stated in my email to you that that yes, we would go yes. somewhere where neither of us could go by ourselves. Something I think new. it's much better that we just allow it to evolve. Yeah. 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 yeah but you put a great story. onus on me to, to say something new, new every time I'm interviewed that I've never said before in 2000 pages. So <laughs> that, that'll be quite a, quite a task. But if you I mean, do say something I could new, lie on, would we? But, but if you do say something new, yeah, it, it, it comes from the interaction. It comes from the relationship. Yeah. So I, quite, I, yes, I have the same thing. Yes. Like, like I sometimes I'm on podcasts where, Afterwards, I'm like, oh, God, I spent half the time quoting myself. You know, I, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I'm like, what was the point? I already said that stuff, you know. But the good interviews are when I'm really tuned into the person who's interviewing me. Yeah. And something yeah. new comes because it maybe does. it's called beginner's mind. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not taking right. refuge in the conceptual castle that I've already built. No, no. And, and so... And I think that that um, future uh, data archaeologists who come across this video from a time when deep fakes, you know, <laughs> were starting to become uh, prevalent, will be able to say, no, this one was actually genuine, because look at <laughs> what these two people said before. Um, um. Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully you're not going to confess right now that you are a deep fake. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you wouldn't get to, to, to spill the beans before the end of our show. But uh, now you now you say it, of course, I'm afraid I have to yeah. have to own up. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a philosophical zombie. So, you know, well, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Hi, it's so... OK, that's here. You can interrupt us. It's, it's... Yes, yes. So I put myself up here because uh, no, I'm noticing the to, time. Yeah. And I, yeah. I thought that maybe we can take the last few minutes for uh, Ian to uh, introduce his new book. Because for me personally, I was wondering, because I come to your first, you know, the, the master and mm. book first. So when I, and I haven't finished. Mm. So I was wondering if, uh, what, what is the good timing to dive into it? And does one, uh, it would be helpful to read your other book before that? Or, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what this uh, new mm. book is? It, sure. Okay. About? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, uh, in brief, it takes the things a lot further than the master and his emissary. And since it says the things that I'm really interested in now, and I did design it so that you wouldn't have to read The Master and His Emissary first. When people ask me this question, I usually say, no, it's OK, you could just start reading the matter with things. But there's no doubt that there is stuff in The Master and His Emissary, which is perhaps an easier read and it's a shorter book, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so in this book, what I did was to take um, the three sections. One is neuropsychology. So I'm looking at um, how the hemisphere thing does change our ability to, to, to um, the difference between hemispheres governs what we can actually take from reality, our portals to reality, things like attention, perception, judgment, and intelligence and creativity, all those things. And in every case, they're better served by the right hemisphere than the left. You may say, well, that doesn't leave the left hemisphere with anything. That doesn't sound possible. But it does, because the left hemisphere is extremely good at grabbing and getting, <laughs> not just using the right hand, but using language in order to trap things and specify them and pin them down and manipulate them. The second part of the book is epistemology. And in brief, I look at what most people would consider probably the four main paths to knowledge. Science, reason, I don't think there'd be any doubt about that. Intuition and imagination, some people will demur on, but I explain why they are extremely important. All four of them have 
a proper role, they have limitations, each one of them. So we need, wherever possible, to bring as many of the four to bear on the question we're looking at as we can. And then part three is uh, ontology or metaphysics, depending on how you want to call it. But basically it's so, armed with this information, when we look at what we can know about the cosmos, what structure does it have? And I have chapters on the coincidence of opposites, the one and the many, and then on things like, you know, small topics like time, space, consciousness, matter, but also values, purpose, and the sense of the sacred, which I think are also non-reducible elements in the cosmos that, again, we don't invent, but actually are things that we respond to. And one of the reasons that there is life at all is to increase the capacity of the cosmos to respond. So that's really the book. And I offer a bit of a critique of where we're at at the end and um, some suggestions of why what we're doing is probably counterproductive and what we might do in its place. Charles, yeah, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, uh, um, yeah Patsy, I just want to just want to um, yeah, I want to thank you uh, also, Ian, for uh, taking the time time with us here. Um, I had a really good time. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's fun. And and yeah, um, don't know what's next, but uh, I hope that we have uh, opportunity again to. Uh, yes, to, I would like that. So yeah. so let's after a decent interval yeah. do something again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. And, and yeah, so yeah, thanks. Um, and, and Patsy, do you want to, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I would have up? one yeah. comment to make. Uh, that was yeah. a really important comment then coming from, uh, you know, my, my own reading and studying of your knowledge is that, uh, you know, my indigenous background and my personal esoteric practices, uh, what really drawn to me into your book is like, it opens up a like very entertaining universe for my left hemisphere. Meanwhile, I also realizing all of the practices that I have been uh, 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 taking on embodying, such as meditation and studying uh, the uh, teachings of the Jesus, the, uh, the Vedantic, uh, the Hermetic science, all of these teachings is essentially um, reawakening the right hemisphere and to uh, ar arising the master with an S to begin to uh, take uh, the, the, the duty, the responsibility to uh, direct our incredibly intelligent and competent pupil, the disciples on the left. <laughs> so I just thought that it was such a beautiful dance and. Uh, so that would be my, my final comment. Uh, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So right. So now, can you just be? Mm -hmm. Can you just be sure to save the chat? I'd be interested to read it because you can never read it. Oh yeah. When you're talking, and I just like to know what questions people had that they weren't able to ask, you know, and that kind of thing. So yeah, thank absolutely. you very much. I'm yeah. And start. thank you, Charles, for for graciously asking me along. It's been absolutely lovely, and we'll do it again. I hope. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks.